Thank you, Karina, and thank you, everyone. It's thanks first to the organizers for this chance to speak today about, um, you know, our work at Mindset Pharma and just, you know, be part of such an interesting symposium with such a spectrum from early research through to clinical development. It's a really exciting time, I think, for the field of psychedelics, and it's a real pleasure to be part of these types of conversation across the spectrum. And thanks again for um, the opportunity to be here. So I'm going to talk today about... Um, developing novel psychedelic inspired medicines, which is the, really the focus of our business at Mindset Pharma. We're a Canadian biotechnology company. Um, I'm just going to check. Um, so just as, you know, these are forward-looking statements, <laughs> usual disclaimers for us biotechs. And, um, you know, just to know that the opinions here are presented on my own. This is um, all unpublished data has been generated and is proprietary to Mindset Pharma. And I'm a consultant for Mindset Pharma, and I'm also a scientific advisor to Shackle for Pharma, and I'm a president of Firewire Consulting LLC. So it's um, so I think we've been through a lot of um, the information in my slides. So I'm going to give everyone a quick reminder of the uh, you know general applications of psychedelics. And just here, I want to flag that human interactions with psychedelic medicines are definitely not new, and I think this goes way back to the indigenous use of psychedelics and then there has been a um, huge renaissance in recent years and I think what I I just modified this um, this figure from a publication from 2017 in Trends of Pharmaceutical Sciences and I just added this green graph showing the number of publications in this space spanning right back from the 1940s through to today and you can see there was a huge dip in research in from the sort of 60s to the late 90s. And I just wanted to flag that in 2022, there have been 844 publications on psychedelics in, on PubMed. And so that's why we're all here today in 2022, that there is a huge opportunity in this space. And you know, I think we're all here to discuss where we are and where we go next. So the contemporary psychedelic landscape, this slide really just shows how the field is evolving. And we've talked about that in multiple details today, but you can see in this, um, this diagram that I took from one of the, the virtual capitalist website, the clinical trials in the psychedelic space as of last year, the end of last year, um, you know, the phase three MAPS trial and then multiple other companies across multiple psychiatric indications developing drugs for patients in this space and Compass is about to start their phase three trial, which will be the first trip to mean trial. What I think that this shows is that regulatory perception is changing, clinical data is growing and infrastructure is building to support this field, which we've you know all talked about in multiple details today. I think some of the really interesting um, statistics in this space, so in 2021, $0.75 billion of publicly disclosed investment went into the psychedelic industry. The important infrastructure in terms of clinic building and therapy, therapy training and therapy design to go with the psycho, psychopharmacology field is evolving. And the next generation psychedelics, which we are generating at Mindset Pharma, are really going to, we hope, deliver new molecules and huge promise that improve patient safety, experience and outcomes. And I think, in, you know, I wanted to flag the two really um, important things in this space. The phase three trial that Compass will start will be the first generation tryptamine psychedelic trial. And also the regulators have given breakthrough designation to the MAPS team for their MDMA and PTSD last year. And I think, you know, that's a real sign of the credibility that is being built in this space by the real innovators in the first generation psychedelics. And I want to acknowledge all the people who are working in that area. So we, we know that there's a huge unmet need in psychiatry and we need more treatments. And I, you know, it's really important to think of um, psychiatry as a highly heterogeneous indication with, you know, many conditions and many causes. And a billion people worldwide in 2017 were living with mental health disorders. That was a, they were the ones who were diagnosed. And obviously there's a huge and growing um, population living with these disorder, 
with mental health disorders in 22 as we come out of the end of the pandemic, hopefully, and also, um, you know, with the other political and social situations in the world. And so we have a trillion dollars annually being lost in productivity as a result of these disorders. So we are in a position where we all have to act in the in the, in modern medicine, we need a change in this in the central nervous system space, and particularly in mental health disorders that affects, you know, so many members of our communities and our families. Um, emerging, but the, the hope is really there. I think that the emerging clinical data with first generation psychedelics really confirms that. And um, we've heard examples today from a number of our speakers around psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine. They are effective in humans in certain, you know, in, in most in broad indications. And, you know, we've seen publications in that area. I just highlight three here. You know, the Carhart Harris study that was pub published in the New in England Journal of Medicine in 2021 showed that two doses of psilocybin was superior to daily acetalopram in improving clinical depression scores in treatment resistant depression patients. And what I think that was, you know, really a compelling study because they showed that patients, their scores came up in terms of their well-being. And that that's something that I think is, you know, the long-term goal is to make is to get people back to living their daily lives. And uh, there was also the study from the Hop Johns Hopkins group in Journal of Psychopharmacology in 2022, where they showed that a single dose of psil psilocybin in major depressive disorder showed improvement in clinical depression scores with up to 12 months of durability in some patients. And I think we do need to remember that this is some patients respond better than others. And that is really where, you know, we need to focus as a field to understand who responds and who doesn't. And that's something that I'm going to talk about in my talk when I talk about our work at Mindset. MDMA assisted therapy. We just had a beautiful talk from Alison. So I'm not, you know, I don't need to go into that in any more detail, but they also showed um, very interesting results with PTSD, as she showed for the substance use disorders. So current data, you know, definitely is showing us that we have huge potential in this space. Um, there's a huge opportunity in this market for broader therapeutic options and modalities. And that's why at Mindset, we're really focused on building a toolbox for patients. So like the patient populations we're trying to treat, psychedelics, and I think Daniel said it earlier, are not a single modality. I mean, a lot of them do act, most of them act through 5-HT2A receptors in some way or modulate serotonin receptors via other mechanisms, but they're not a single type of therapeutic and, not, and our patients are not single patients. So I think we really need to think carefully about how we address this in going forward and some of my talk today I'm going to talk about you know some of the ideas there which I think we all need to test from a basic research perspective and a clinical observations perspective and then I'm going to talk about the mindset strategy and really the sort of um, research pipeline that we're developing in, and how we're addressing that and it's I think it is differentiated from what we've talked about earlier so I think it's really um, a nice compliment to everything that the rest of the teams have showed us today in terms of how they're approaching this problem. So I just have a slide here. This, this diagram is really just showing the sort of, you know, the serotonin, serotonergic psychedelics that we're all aware of, you know, the psilocybin, LSD, DMT and 5-methoxy-DMT and how they, the downstream pathways that they trigger. And I think Kurt gave a really nice summary of those downstream pathways earlier today in terms of the plasticity and the modulation. So I'm not going to go into that, but I think I just wanted to highlight here that there's probably most, when we look at drug development in general, there's probably multiple layers of this pathway where we could potentially target if we understand how each of the psychedelics is modulating some of these pathways. And I think that that's something that we really don't have much information on as, as of yet in terms of how we're going to do that. So I think there's a lot of um, future opportunity. So how do psychedelics work? I think this is, you know, one of the most interesting questions of the modern day, really. Um, you know, it's a real combination of psychological and physiological effects that explain how a psychedelic works. And there's a really, um, there's, we've talked a lot about the overweighted default mode network in depression and also, you know, fundamental underlying network deficits in various models. And I really like this um, paper that Carhart and Friston published in 2019, where they modeled a lot of the functional network changes that are observed in um, patients and then in the psychedelic experience and they propose this sentence which I think really encompasses 
what we all think about how psychedelics are modulating rumination disorders. So they re relax the precision weighting of pathologically weighted priors underpinning various expressions of mental illness. And I think what that really starts to explain is that sort of loop that you can get locked in through prior experience in terms of your functional network activity and some of these rumination disorders, which can encompass depression, addiction, and others. And really what we think the psychedelic does is sort of open those loops up to, you know, modification and find a way out of those challenging situations that the brain ends up in. And so those physiological and psychological changes due to psychedelics, there's tons of examples of functional network connectivity. I think there was some really nice examples in Alison's talk as well about the modulation of ex increased excitability in certain brain regions, but or re reduction in excitability in certain brain regions, but then differences in how they communicated with each other, both during and after the psychedelic experience. And, um, you know, I think one of the most um, profound observations across the psychedelics is that that default mode network, which is the way that your brain, you know, is basically connecting various regions to each other, actually changes in during the psychedelic experience and then afterwards. And that's probably some of those network pathologies that are actually reworking as, as part of that um, plasticity change. So next generation psychedelics. There's various approaches that companies like Mindset are taking. So what we are looking at is in the near term optimizing existing psychedelics. So designing compounds that have similar properties and are benchmarked to existing psychedelics to really understand how we can make better therapeutic options. And that can include various ways of, you know, changing the um, changing the duration of the trip, changing the, the strength of the trip, the onset of the trip. So we're looking at various modalities, which I'm going to tell you about in um, when I talk about the science in a minute. But just before that, I think that there's, you know, that in terms of the future of psychedelic drug discovery, I think we also have the opportunity as we um, to look at the various different pathways that are involved in the psychedelic experience and also some of those underlying network pathways that are involved in the disease manifestations themselves and the various different disorders that we're looking at. And then also using human variation and genetics. So a lot of the research that was done on psychedelics was done before the molecular era. And we're in a new space now where we have access to big data sets of human data for functional genomics, understanding are there, for example, rare diseases where people have a modulation of a, a, a mutation in their serotonergic receptors like schizophrenia where they do get hallucinations can we back translate some of those disease mechanistic understandings back to find therapeutics that do similar on a short-term basis you know i think there's a huge potential there in terms of the future in the molecular era that we really just are only starting to tap into as a field and obviously we talked earlier about the need for funding in basic science in order to do that. So hopefully changing the perception of the field will increase investment in the space and really help us to uncover some of that. Um, and then again, I think we, we need to understand more about the basic biology and functional differences of the various rumination disorders. And it might be that it doesn't need to be specific to a certain patient population or it might be that it does and I think you know that's the kind of thing that we won't know until we get more data to generate that information there's obviously the non-psychoactive compounds do we really need the psychedelic trip we had we had lots of discussion on that today and I think again we will find out as we progress the field we also need more translational models so you know Matthias you have a really nice talk this morning about some of the Charles River models in that space I'm going to talk about the one that we are using as part of our um, benchmarking of compounds later and uh, we also need translational biomarkers to identify patients so is there something that tells us prior to treatment is there a, is there a molecular or um, functional predictor of treatment response and we'll when we start to generate that information it will help us to improve patient outcomes in the space so we have a lot more to do that's good we're i think we're all in the job for a long time in this area um so just around the clinical administration of psychedelics this is another area where there's huge unknowns and huge debate you know many questions remain for the field 
Um, obviously, patient safety and efficacy remain at the forefront of our research. But in terms, we are we need to understand more about therapy innovation. What types of therapy do certain patient populations respond to? How much therapy is needed? Um, next generation molecules, how are we going to apply those? How are they going to differentiate from what we already have? The goal is that they will be optimized and, you know, provide different solutions. But I think we need, we also need to think about next generation treatment models. You know, there's going to probably be a digital aspect to these, these treatment paradigms that we'll, we'll be able to do remote monitoring, remote therapy sessions, digital solutions to track patient outcomes in the long term. I think a lot of companies are starting to think now clinically about how they're going to collate the important data that's going to help us understand more about the field and move forward. This is just a, you know, a sort of structural diagram or a look at, you know, we know for most of the psychedelic treatments that you have a preparation session, particularly in the psilocybin space, and then a psychedelic session, and then the integration session, and then potentially additional therapy. Do you need another trip? And there's various different questions at each step of that paradigm, like how many preparation sessions are needed? What, how long before? Do we, what, what structure do they need to be? What type of training does the therapist need to have? And then, you know, all of those questions go right through the paradigm. And I think we've, there's been a lot of, of discussion around that today, but it still remains open questions for the field. So now I'm going to talk about Mindset. Um, so Mindset was founded in 2019. We're a public company um, since 2022. Um, we executed our first development part partnership in 2022 with Otska Pharmaceuticals with their um, MSRD, which is their US subsidiary, and they're funding two of our compound families um, in the research and development through phase 1B. We're also innovating in process chemistry for both first and next generation psychedelics, including psilocybin. We have a portfolio of academic partnerships to really build some of the basic research understanding in the field. And we're also growing our portfolio and in inventory and always seeking new partnerships to progress those molecules through to, through to development. So what happened with Mindset as the scientific founders that I'm gonna tell you about in a minute, identified an opportunity from the emerging data in the field to really build new chemistry in this space and put down some of the earliest IP applications around novel chemistry for 5-HT2A receptor modulation. And this was driven by their understanding of the huge unmet need in psychiatry. And since 2020, the company has designed more than 200 molecules, filed 14 patents to date across a spectrum of next generation psychedelics with different scaffolds. We've run hundreds of compounds through um, selectivity and potency screens. We've run hundreds of in vivo experiments and pharmacokinetic experiments to understand the tar target engagement and then the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetic relationships of each of these compounds. And then we've run tens of efficacy studies. And we've partnered two of our series, as I mentioned, and we're preparing our first molecule for IND. We have the regulatory meeting planned in the second half of this year. And we're still designing, so the portfolio is constantly expanding. This is a picture of our co-founders, Joseph Arujo and Malik Slassi. I'm sure um, some of you guys might know them well, but Joseph's a highly experienced behavioral pharmacologist and entrepreneur. He has more than 20 years of experience supplying in innovative biological solutions to drug development through his um, his work in, 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 in a CRO and also in, in terms of founding other companies. And Malik's a highly experienced medicinal chemist and entrepreneur with over 30 years of experience in small molecule drug development. And he's delivered high quality candidates that have been through late stage preclinical development, clinical development, and some to the market. So I think the combination of chemistry and biology expertise that we have in our founders really is a strength of the mindset team and really allows us to differentiate and push our portfolio of broad spectrum psychedelic compounds into, you know, through, through the phases that we need to, to get to development. Uh, this is the leadership team. So, um, you know, I sit on the management team with James Lanthier, our CEO. He's a seasoned CEO with lots of experience in building companies and successful. We also have a really experienced board of directors and our scientific advisory board is really positioned to support us as we move these programs through to the clinic. So we have both Michael Rogowski and Ishrat Hussein, who are prominent neurologists. Ishrat actually has been part of the um, 
the, the only stylist I've been trialed in Canada. And then we also have on our advisory board Guy Higgins and Nina Dolanoy, who are PhD pharmacologists who lead all of our research um, in vivo research activities. And they really help us to sort of move these programs forward as fast as possible to the clinic. This is our pipeline. I already mentioned that we have four main families that we've disclosed in the pub public domain of compounds. Um, the first is our family one, which I'm going to talk more about today, which is our proprietary program with the most progressed candidate that is we are moving towards the clinic now. And then our family two and four are partnered with Otska, as I mentioned. And then the family three program is designed to um, support a more um, microdosing like paradigm or a chronic indication program where so the, we're selecting all of these compounds based on the pharmacology at the receptors and we also have a number of programs in that are undisclosed at this time so in terms of our small molecule program you know we're advancing preclinical assets with significant short and long-term commercial potential in, and market potential. And we also have solid backup programs. So we're running these studies as a traditional pharmaceutical company type program where we have lead assets and then backup programs ready to take the place if things change over time. The compounds are all small molecules and for most programs are orally bioavailable. And we have a sort of set of character, characteristics for each of the programs that in our target product profiles that we're looking for to develop. And the assets go through a a, a screening cascade with a parallel intellectual pro property program, which I'm going to tell you more about. And we have a really strategic and integrated project management of each of our programs so that we can really fast traje have a fast trajectory to clinical trials, knowing that, you know, there is a huge unmet need in this area and patients are waiting for solutions. So we are running all of our preclinical toxicology, CMC and regulatory activities as soon as we can to move these programs forward. And we have both um, we have an optimized and patented micro macrodose program. So that follows the traditional one-time psychedelic treatment and encompassing therapy. And then we also have a macro microdosing program, which is earlier stage for chronic indications that has a lot more sort of basic research support being built to, to progress that. And we also, as a, part, a company looking with a partnering strategy, we really look for partners who can resource and bring expertise in regulatory strategy, clinical development, and commercialization to accelerate our macrodose program. You know, we're a really research focused company that looks for that later stage partnering. And we also are looking for resources in our partners to support exploratory work for indication expansions and microdose programs. Um, so, our chemistry platform, I did mention in terms of. Um, you know, the various focuses, but it, this is just um, to, as a bit of background to so the Family One program, it's psilocybin inspired. Um, the compounds are screened to be 5-HT2A receptor ag ag agonists. And then we also look at them in, the, um, in an in vivo setting, which I'm going to take you through some of the data to show. I'm not going to talk about our other families today. So this is our discovery platform. It's, you know, it's a fairly standard um, stepwise approach to finding the right chemical candidates to move forward. We, and, you know, our main goal is to find optimized, patentable next generation molecules because we already, I think in the panel earlier, we talked about the money that we need to, in, in order to, and the time it takes to progress molecules. And so it is helpful to have the longest patent protection you can to realistically attract investors to progress these programs forward. So we have a chemical design and synthesis part and then we do 5-HT receptor screening to look for compounds that have a profile that we are looking for and then we do in vitro profiling of for the various um, ADME properties and um, pharmaco in, in vitro properties like off-target screening and then we do compound selection and then we move the compounds that fit the early profile we've identified for a certain program through to the in vivo platform where we do um, as a starting point we start with the head twitch assay and then we differentiate our compounds by benchmarking them to the traditional psychedelics that they're in they're designed to be like um, comparing them to others so we and, and in in parallel with that we really do have an aggressive ip strategy to protect each of our molecule families as we go forward this is the slide just highlights our intellectual property today i've only got the um, list of patents on there that are already in the public domain. 
but the patentability and optimized efficacy are really differentiators of next generation psychedelics. The drug discovery needs to be done and our novel NCEs have a different scheduling to date. So that allows us to do research at this point. Um, we know that scheduling is a single point in time, but at the moment we can run assays as needed in the countries where we're running our studies. And they will be rolled out as medicines. And, and I think reimbursement of no, novel therapeutics is, you know, obviously an important consideration for us. So in terms of our compound family one, the background, it's a novel deuterated and non-deuterated psilocybin, psilocin inspired new chemical entities. Um, we have synthesized 21 compounds today and we have two patents filed um, with priority date of February 2020 and the leads are allowable with patent pending. Um, we have comprehensive data set benchmark to psilocybin and psilocin. We have in vitro profiling and safety data, in vivo profiling and safety. And we also have behavioral pharmacology studies. So as I said, we use the traditional psychedelic head twitch model for our original on target confirmation in vivo. And then we use, you know, the other observations of wet dog shakes, um, core body temperature, locomotor activity. And then we do these drug discrimination studies that I'll um, tell you more about in a minute. And then we do really clear pharmacokinetic profile in plasma, CSF and brain because we really want to understand how the pharmacokinetic, pharmacodynamic profile of our compounds fits with the target product profile we're looking at. And so family one, we have a lead uh, clinical candidate that we are progressing and also a close backup program. And the compounds exi do exhibit differentiated pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties to psilocybin. And our goal is to well, have a well-tolerated administration in a clinical program with therapy and, and no adverse experiences. So this family um, has composition of matter pattern pending. We've developed the CMC and we have a kilogram of GMP material in hand as of this month. So we're ready to go as soon as we have the um, appropriate um, approval to move forward. Um, at this po point, we're not scheduled, um, we, but we do expect that that will be um, revisited when we move to the clinic. We have CNS penetrant and orally active 5-HG receptor agonists, and the profile is very similar to psilocybin for this family, which was an intentional part of the design. And I'm going to show you the differentiated in vivo drug discrimination and pharmacokinetic profile of an example compound from this family. And then we have favorable in vivo safety in preclinical models at 10 times the efficacious doses. So this is, um, we, we, as I said, we run everything head to head with psilocybin and sometimes psilocin depending on the model. Um, because our goal is to really understand how we are getting differentiation from the existing psychedelics because in order to have you know a viable path forward we need to have a differentiated platform and so this is you know the traditional 5-HT to a receptor activity just to confirm that we're on target which is the first screen that we run in our cascade and then we also look at the various other profiles in ADMI this is a bit the head-to-head -head mouse behavior data so we start everything with mouse head twitch um, you can see at low doses and high doses, our family one compounds both exhibit head twitch. Um, and we also see that the activity is on target and it's completely reversed by a 5-HT to a antagonist and 10907. So we show that it's completely 5-HT to a dependent. And we have a head twitch ED50 of about 0.5 mg per kg sub subcutaneously. Um, we also, this is an, another slide on the head, the mouse behavior. So we look, this is a, a, do, a, big, a more extensive dose response of the head twitch. Um, and you can see that our head twitch is more potent in terms of you see more head twitch, uh, the increase in doses than we do with psilocybin. But, um, and then we also see that we, di we do differentiate the, in the core body temperature monitoring, we see a, a less profound effect on um, core body temperature at the high dose than we see with psilocybin, which, you know, might translate into improved tolerability in trials. And um, we see a difference in the locomotor activity and also in the um, psilocybin-induced rears. Now I'm going to move on to our rat behaviors. So the second 
part of our studies after we've done the basic benchmarking in mouse is to look at um, moving to the rat where we can we have a more comprehensive behavioral assay. Um, and we see again that we see the 5-HT2A signs are very similar to psilocybin with our NCEs in the family one compounds. And then apart from in the locomotor assay, we see a less profound effect on locomotor activity than is observed for psilocybin. And in, in the PK, we see we see various pharmacokinetic profiles, but you can see in this molecule, that's an example, that we see a different onset with this molecule than we see with um, psilocybin. And what we, do, what we are really interested to know is whether these differentiations in how you know, you get the build up to a trip and how that changes could be, could translate into something meaningful in, in a clinical setting. So our, I think our main um, differentiator in terms of the f in vivo pharmacology that we're running at Mindset is we're using the rat drug discrimination assay, which is, um, you know, a well-used assay in terms of understanding are usually used as a safety readout for abuse liability and other things but basically what you do is you train rats to discriminate psilocybin from saline and so we don't know what a psychedelic trip feels like to a rat but by training them to respond to a food reward when they're in the psychological state of a psilocybin like versus a saline experience they can almost tell us what how they feel compared to a non um, psychedelic. And so what we do is we train them to psilocybin at a dose that we know produces a re robust response. Um, and then we test our compounds in those animals that can tell us the difference between psilocybin and saline. And we see if they recognize our molecules as psilocybin-like or saline-like. And you get a various range of generalization and our in the family one compounds fully generalized to psilocybin. So the rats confirm that they feel the same in, the, in those experiences as, as much as they can tell us. And we do think that, and what's also interesting with the drug discrimination assay is we can look at the duration of action of our psychedelics. So we can look at how long that generalization to the psilocybin lasts for. So we can see if we're changing the sort of time course of, a, of the experiment. Um, I, I think my, my bullet points have changed on this slide on the little question marks. So I apologize for that. There's no questions involved. It's just a translational effect to Google Documents, I think. <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, so we, then we also do safety benchmarking. So we have an exploratory safety assay where we look at the traditional um, readouts for safety, including you know mortality rate, clinical pathology, ne necropsy, organ weights, all of the various different alertness measures. And um, we see similar or better to psilocybin, and all of these things are sort of building the bigger picture of where um, our molecules differentiate. And then in terms of PK, um, this is we we use we use both exploratory PK of you know sometimes just a single dose or a various dose, and then we also do safety pharmacokinetic to look at the sort of various readouts in males and females over time. And this um, this diagram just shows that we're benchmarking our um, compounds. This is the psilocybin safety data, um, and we have similar data for each of our compounds to look at plasma exposure, kinetics with respect to dose response, the Cmax, and any other parameters that may differentiate. And the, on the right, I just have an example of the types of profile we're looking for. So we're looking for things like a shorter PK to, you know, potentially address the duration of action, translational challenges of running. Um, clinical trials with a long duration active psychedelic, looking for reduced exposure, different onsets, and we're using a sort of paradigm to understand those things. So in terms of making novel psychedelics, I think, you know, the mindset goal is to use a patient-focused opportunity to expand and optimize the existing psychedelic toolbox. So, you know, this is a huge population issue to address and I think that you know all of the companies in this space are going to have a, a part to play in building the toolbox of therapeutics that we need to address such a big problem. The mindset discovery platform that I've talked about today has really generated the broadest novel psychedelic intellectual port property portfolio in the field and the strategic compound design coupled with that high quality benchmarking is really helping us to appropriately um, address, move these forwards to the clinic as quickly as possible.
And the field is evolving with increasing data and clinical insights. And we're continuing to monitor that space and in, incorporate a lot of the new findings into our drug discovery and design. And we're expanding the portfolio. And um, in terms of, you know, the future of psychedelics, I touched on this earlier. So if you go Google image search for psychedelics as of this week, you know, when you Google psychedelics, you see these eclectic, colorful pictures. And when you when you Google antidepressants, you see, you know, a lot of pots of pills. And I think, you know, our goal as a field is to really change the narrative on these powerful chemical entities and confirm their clinical efficacy so that when we search for them, they'll be seen as therapeutics in the future. So I'd really like to thank everyone for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. That was a great presentation. Um, we do have a couple of virtual questions, unless there's anyone in the audience. Thank you for the talk, very, very interesting. In your IND roundmap slide, there was a one line in safety uh, part which said uh, mini pumps. Are you administering continuously psychedelics to mice and rats in the safety studies? No, not at this point. So these are exploratory safety studies just to look at you know, the effects of um, either one time or daily treatments of the psychedelic, but it's not on a mini pump. Okay, what, um, what did that mean? Um, Oh, I, I think that that might be um, a slide that I <laughs> the minute did where was was it in the slide on the I in the roadmap thing. Hang on. If, if you go back. Let me check. In here. No, way, way earlier. Oh. If you continue. Still. In here? No, no. I'll I'll tell you and stuff. <laughs> Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that's, so that's something we are looking at doing in terms of our pipeline is looking at the longer term effects of those compounds. And I think that that will only really be necessary for the non-orally bioavailable compounds. So we do, we do various assays depending on the, um, you know, the, the type of molecule we're looking at. But all of our, most of our psilocybin-like molecules, we're running in with oral studies um just because that's the goal from a clinical perspective and we do, but we do sometimes do oral and subcut for the drug discrimination so we can compare and also sometimes IV to look at the various profiles and especially for the CNS profiling sometimes obviously because of the fasted versus non-fasted animals we sometimes have to um you know decide which is the best way to ask the question um for the various different programs thank you and one more do you run those in vivo pharmacology and efficacy studies in-house? Um, so we, we partner with InterVivo Solutions for our preclinical studies. And um, we're actually working with Charles River at the moment on some of our and enabling toxicology. So we use, we, everything is outsourced. So the company is a total of six people and um, we outsource everything. Okay, thank you. No, it's a pleasure, thank you. Thank you. So a question came in. Can you talk a little bit more about the drug discrimination assay and its utility to determine the efficacy of novel psychedelics? Yes, yeah, so I think I, I did go through um, the drug discrimination assay in general, but we have animals that are trained to the various different psychedelics. So depending on the profile that we're looking for, we, we benchmark them to the most similar psychedelics. And interestingly, we can also look at whether, you know, for example, an animal sees um, psilocybin like LSD or you know for how long and so we can compare and actually there's just been a clinical study that's come out um, from mind I think it was MindMed that looked at psilocybin and LSD experiences for patients and the only I think the only reported difference was the duration of action so we think that there's quite a translational effect of that um, various that various psychedelics might feel different in different scenarios. And hopefully that we hope that we can use the drug discrimination assay to help us understand that in a preclinical setting, which is, you know, a challenging place to model this type of pharmacology. Yes, of course. And then um, I guess lastly, um, what is Mindset's next step in the path to clinical development? Okay, so um, I think I mentioned we are in the process of, um, we have a regulatory meeting for our early family 
um, set up. So for the second half of this year, and we're just pu pulling together all the information for that. And we're also, um, you know, our other programs that are partnered are progressing forwards as well, but the, the, how they're progressing is not publicly disclosed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.